Hi everyone, my name is Tom and I'm a part of the engineering geodesy group here at IGG. So today I will tell you in short how the coordinate transformations are used uh, in our group and applied on the most common geodetic instruments and in the most common geodetic tasks. Just to be on the same page, here is a definition of engineering ge geodesy derived recently by Professor Kuhlmann, one of the teachers on this uh, master study, and his colleagues. In short, it is a discipline of reality capture and monitoring of geometry-related phenomena. In other words, we are using different sensors to capture the geometry of our environment, and we use coordinate systems, reference frames, and coordinates transformations in order to describe this geometry and to describe how it changes over time. Here, probably the main accent is placed on the quality of our geometric products. If you are interested more in our work, I would really recommend you to read this article that I uh, showed uh, on the bottom of this slide. Um, this lecture will be separated in four small chapters. First, I will summarize the main geodetic tasks that require coordinates transformations. Then I will talk shortly about how instrument-related coordinate systems of some sensors are realized, about transformations between different local sensor coordinate systems, which is often called registration, and finally about the transformation of these local coordinate systems into global one, which is often called with this separate name georeferencing, although it is practically the same thing as registration. You are all probably familiar with the most iconic geodetic instrument, the total station, or with the older version, Theodolite. Once we position this instrument or the total station somewhere in our environment, we also position a small local coordinate system with the origin somewhere inside the instrument, which is arbitrarily rotated in space. And um, the total station is used actually for a pointwise measurement. So in order to capture the geometry of some object in our surrounding, we need to select the most important points, for example, these edges of the lake on the upper picture, and uh, we need to orient our telescope in that direction, aim at these points and take measurements. As a result, in the end, we have 3D coordinates of all selected points in the local instrument-related coordinate system. Mm, actually, there are only a few tasks in engineering geodesy that do not really require coordinate transformation. This happens when we need to measure a relatively small object and analyze what happens with this object in a relatively short period of time. A possible example of such a simple uh, task is presented on this slide. Uh, and our task here is a deformation monitoring of a small bridge. So we set up our instrument, Total Station, and therefore we also set up this uh, local coordinate system and then we make a pointwise measurement of the whole bridge uh, with the selecting points uh, well distributed across the whole bridge and with this uh, we captured some um, some 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 previous state or zero state of our instrument its uh, original geometry then uh, we wait until some uh, some some uh, train is placed over the bridge in order to induce the deformation and then we capture our measurements all over again and um, our analysis requires that we compare the geometry before the weight of the train is uh, put on the bridge and after it happened and as all of our measurements and the whole analysis is actually happening within the same local coordinate system uh, defined with the station of our instrument, we do not need the coordinate transformation. However, most often we need to measure large and complex objects and to do so, we need to set up the instrument on multiple positions and as you can see, for example, in this image. And uh, we need multiple positions to capture actually all necessary details. So in order to make any kind of analysis of this object or object's geometry after the measurements, the 3D coordinates of all measured points need to be in a single unique coordinate system. 
and therefore we need the coordinates transformations between these local sensor coordinate systems that are defined on each station um, or in other words we need the registration process uh, one of the most common genetic tasks currently in the industry is creating 3d models of buildings and this task without a doubt requires measurements from multiple positions and coordinate transformations our main example in this presentation will be a 3d model of a Popelsdorf castle which is located here in Bonn near our institute so in the last years instead of total stations for such measurements we frequently use terrestrial laser scanners or TLS those are similar instruments however instead of uh, selecting and aiming single points of interest scanners can sample the environment automatically and with high frequency of, the, of up to 1 million points per second and they can measure the whole environment around themselves except the very small uh, conical area underneath the instrument and as a result we have a point cloud capturing detailed geometry of the measured object as you can see on the right hand side so in short uh, with laser scanners we have high level of detail high automation and really high measurement speed uh, on this slide you can see a realistic measurement setup which is necessary to achieve the full coverage of the purpose of castle from outside so we need four stations to capture the facade from from the outside uh, part and we need one station to uh, measure the inner circle so there will be a multiple point clouds captured one after another from different instrument positions or scanner stations and the locations uh, or the local coordinate systems of these uh, instrument positions will be arbitrarily placed in space and also arbitrarily rotated and because of that uh, once the measurements are loaded in the computer in our software they will look like a complete mess so in order to be able to make a 3d model they need to be correctly organized by applying the correct set of the coordinate transformations or we need to make this point cloud registration and uh, once the point clouds are correctly and accurately registered the end result will look somehow like uh, this picture as you can see on this slide so the coordinates of all points in the point cloud are then given in one unique local coordinate system and in practice this is typically the coordinate system of one arbitrary chosen uh, scanner station for example this blue one or the first scanner station uh, so in short TLS registration is just merging multiple point clouds together in a single local coordinate system by applying the correct coordinate transformations And uh, this is the final point cloud uh, after the registration. This is actually a video, but I have some te technical difficulties, which I am not sure if I will be able to resolve. Anyway, uh, the final step after all the point clouds are registered in a single coordinate system is mathematical approximation of these point clouds or generating a 3D model. And uh, one of the reasons why we need to generate a 3D model is because the point cloud is really hard to handle and hard to analyze and it uh, takes up a lot of space on or memory uh, on a hard drive so it typically has some tens of gigabytes while the 3d model can be easy to analyze and handle and can uh, take only a couple of megabytes and for example it can be stored in a pdf file and viewed so sometimes our work stops with a 3d model but very often the model and the point cloud need to be correctly positioned on earth so in other words these arbitrary local coordinates need to be transformed into a global earth centered coordinate system such as for example ITRF or WGS84 system this makes the second most common geodetic task involving coordinates transformation and it is often called georeferencing and 
And the last set of the coordinate transformations that we commonly use is transfer of these global centered Earth fixed coordinates into the official coordinate system of the state. The official coordinates are typically split in two separate coordinate systems. The coordinate system defining a 2D position, which is related to the relevant cartographic projection. This is most commonly UTM projection. And the second one is the 1D coordinate system defining height, which typically relates to some form of the mean sea level surface. I will uh, talk a bit more about this topic in the next lecture. So, to summarize, there are three common tasks in everyday life of geodetic engineer that require coordinate transformations. And these are registration or combining uh, several measurements of several different sensor related coordinate systems into an arbit arbitrary but unique coordinate system. Then we have georeferencing or uh, transformation of these local coordinates into the global ones. And finally, we have uh, the projection, cartographic projections, which help us to uh, transform these uh, global coordinates into the coordinate systems, official coordinate systems of the state. In the next section, I'll tell you how sensor related coordinate systems are realized for the sensors that are most often used in the work of geodetic engineers. So let's start. So, unlike the GNSS receivers uh, in uh, mobile phones, uh, which have the positioning accuracy somewhere between 5 and 15 meters, the geodetic engineers use more expensive GNSS receivers. Uh, as you can see, uh, example on these two figures, uh, which, uh, are, which have much more sophisticated uh, receivers and they can uh, better process the satellite signal and they have better antennas. We, and both of them allows us better measurement accuracy. So in typical mapping tasks uh, for, or for estimating the position of mobile mapping systems such, the Google, such as the Google car that you can see here, we have some uh, positioning accuracy in the level of several, several, several centimeters, while um, if we want to get really accurate, we use these uh, static GNSS observations with a device such as the green one that you can see here, and we can reach the positioning accuracy in the level of millimeters. In any case, with the GNSS, we can observe 3D Cartesian coordinates of our position directly in a global geocentric coordinate system. And for example, the most famous of all GNSS systems, GPS, American GPS, gives the coordinates in uh, World Geodetic System 84, WGS, uh, coordinate system, which is defined as follows. So the center or the origin of the coordinate system is given in the earth, uh, center of the Earth masses. The uh, x-axis passes through the zero meridian that goes through Greenwich. Uh, the z-axis more or less coincides with the Earth rotational axis and the y-axis closes the right-handed coordinate system. But you will hear more about this in the GNSS module. The second sensor that we frequently use to reconstruct the geometry of the environment around us uh, is actually the camera. Uh, it's most commonly used in photogrammetry, but it's not uncommon that the geodetic engineers uses, use, use it as well. Uh, we use it either handheld for terrestrial measurements or carried by UAVs for aerial measurements. And in each case, in order to be able to reconstruct the geometry, we need both a well-defined sensor-related coordinate system and we also need the relative positions between and orientations between these uh, well-defined coordinate systems, as you can he see here on uh, this image. So uh, the process of generating point clouds using images is called structure from motion, and you will hear more about it from Professor Stachnes in the photogrammetry-related re lectures. Uh, here, I would just like to briefly introduce you uh, the 
a coordinate system of the camera and uh, this is um, geometry of the most common camera model the pinhole camera model um, so in the case of camera we can actually define two separate coordinate system a 2d coordinate system of an image or image coordinate system in which our measurements or the pixels are taken um, and uh, we have the 3d coordinate system of the camera body and knowing the exact relations between these two systems is necessary for 3D geometric reconstruction. In short, so the camera coordinate system is 3D orthogonal system with the origin in this point X0, uh, which uh, is uh, located in camera aperture. And uh, Z axis uh, coincides with uh, our viewpoint direction and it is often called optical axis, principal axis, or principal ray, while the x and y axis uh, spawn through the plane which is parallel to the image plane, and uh, it is offset from this image plane exactly for the value C uh, for the focal point which needs to be known uh, for the 3D reconstruction. Um, so the offset, what I said, needs to be known, and the 2D coordinate system of the image spawns, spawns through this image plane, where x and y axes are parallel to the ones from the 3D coordinate system, and they are uh, within this uh, image plane, while the origin of this 2D system is in the image center or the principal point. So. Uh, to summarize, in order to make a 3D geometry reconstruction, we need uh, observations or image pixels, which are well defined in the local, which are well defined in the local uh, image coordinate system. We need the camera position and orientation, which is defined uh, with this uh, sensor coordinate system, and we need to have multiple. Uh, photograph, photographs taken from different positions and we need to know the coordinate transformations between these positions. So again, we need sensor-related coordinate systems and transformations between them. So the mighty total station. I still didn't tell you how this instrument works. So uh, once when we uh, turn our instrument towards some point that we are interested in, um, we uh, can measure the distance to this from the central point of the instrument to this point using electronic distance measurement device or EDM or, or laser because uh, it, this, this instrument works on the using the laser, laser measurements and um, so we are measuring the distance D and we also have two angular encoders which are tracking and measuring the rotation of the instrument uh, the whole instrument around the standing axis and also um, the rotation of our te telescope around uh, the uh, around the horizontal axis so the instrument actually has uh, three main axes the main or the vertical or standing axis it has the horizontal axis passing here through the telescope and we have collimation axis um, which um, which goes in the direction um, to the point that we are looking at at the moment and the uh, origin or the central point of the coordinate system is where these three main axes meet um, so our measurements are actually distance di uh, distance angle and angle um, so our original measurement coordinate system is polar or spherical one but because of easier representation and analysis these coordinates are almost always transformed into 3d cartesian coordinates and uh, on the right hand side of this slide you can see one realization uh, of this 3d coordinate system and um, and there is also a set of uh, known equations of course to transform these uh, polar coordinates into Cartesian ones and uh, when using these uh, formulations and making this transformation you need to pay particular attention how 
the manufacturers of the instrument define their local coordinate systems. So sometimes the zero direction of measuring angles can be in the direction of the x-axis, sometimes it can be in the direction of the y-axis, sometimes the instrument can uh, count the rotation in this direction, sometimes in this direction, and so on. So generally, uh, these coordinate transformations are quite flexible. Mm. The 3D terrestrial laser scanners, as the one that I previously presented you, are actually quite similar to total stations. So again, they have these three main axes, which are orthogonal in the perfect case, and um, the, they have local uh, coordinate system with the origin where these three axes intersect. The main uh, difference or addition in terrestrial laser scanning is that here in this intersect, they actually have this rotating mirror and uh, how it works is that the EDM or laser source uh, shoots the laser beam to this uh, rotational mirror which is inclined for 45 degrees so that the laser beam exits the instrument forming the right angle. And this uh, rotational mirror is uh, really fastly spinning around the horizontal axis, deflecting the laser beams. And with this, in this way, we are measuring one vertical profile. Um, uh, of our environment. And uh, at the same time, while this uh, mirror is spinning, the whole instrument is rotating around its vertical or standing axis, as you can see here, and this way we are measuring the whole 3D environment. So again, our observations are distance angle angle, and we need to transform these uh, polar or spherical coordinates to Cartesian ones in order to uh, easily handle and analyze the point clouds. And um, yeah, that's it more or less for 3D terrestrial laser scanners. Um, now uh, I would like to just um, make a few more parallels. So very often for mobile mapping, uh, we use 2D laser scanners, which can be considered just as a simplified version of a 3D laser scanner. So the only thing is that we do not have any more the rotation around the vertical or standing axis, but we still have the horizontal axis. We have one angular encoder, which is uh, following these rotations, and we have uh, one EDM device that can rapidly fire laser beams and measure the distance to each point. Um, so these 2D laser scanners, or sometimes in robotics called 2D LiDAR, uh, are uh, also frequently used, well, also in robotics for mapping and navigation of the robots. And uh, here I sketched uh, some simple example of this uh, coordinate system of this device, which can again be uh, directly uh, related to the total station, where we have one angular encoder in this box uh, following the motion of this laser beam, which spins uh, in this direction. Uh, we have uh, so laser device which measures the distance to each point in our environment. And uh, here again, as this is 2D measurement system, we have one fixed angle which is actually the right angle uh, in comparison to the spinning axis. And uh, very similarly, we also have 3D LiDAR which is often used in robotics and for example autonomous driving uh, where the principle is the same, just the number of uh, laser beams is different. And um, as we have many laser beams which are positioned within one vertical plane, uh, here the difference is that we have an angular encoder which uh, measures the spinning motion or tracks these, angle, uh, these angles around this uh, vertical axis. We have uh, each of these laser lasers uh, for measuring the distance to the point. And uh, in comparison to 3D terrestrial laser scanner, we do not have different uh, vertical angles for each measurement. So we do not need to have vertical angular encoder. Rather, these uh, vertical angles are fixed for each of the laser beams in the instrument. And that's it. Those are uh, the most common uh, sensors that are used in uh, our geodetic engineering group. And now I will uh, talk a little bit about these uh, re registration between uh, local sensor coordinate systems.
Um, so to repeat, we measure large objects and we have more than one instrument position. Each position has its own coordinate system and we need to describe the transformation between these coordinate systems. For example, we need to describe the transformation between coordinate system B and coordinate system A. In 99% of the cases, we will describe these coordinate transformations with seven parameter Helmer transformation equation or with 3D similarity transformation. So the transformation from the system B to system A uh, would, be, would require just estimating the rotation, which is typically represented with Euler angles, a scale factor, and the translation. So, um, Professor Stachnitz learned you that you have several possibilities for representation of the rotations. In our geodetic tasks, we uh, almost exclusively use Euler angles because they are quite intuitive. They are easy to work with, especially when they need to be assigned some probability or the accuracy values. And finally, in engineering geodesy, the runtime is never an issue. So there is no particular need for using highly computationally efficient quaternions. So to summarize, we have a little in this a little bit different equation, we have seven parameters or seven degrees of freedom that need to be known for the registration between sensor coordinate systems. So to define these seven parameters, we need at least seven corresponding observations or coordinates in each local coordinate system. So, which enable us actually to compute a single analytical solution. Or if we have more than seven uh, observations, this allows us the use of the adjustment and estimation algorithms. And you will learn more about them in the module statistics and adjustment theory. Anyway, in practical realizations, these observations need to be well distributed in our environment or otherwise we will have an ill-posed set of equations. Hence, our estimates will either be very imprecise or the adjustment procedure will fail. And uh, finally, uh, as I will mention in the following slides again, one of the main problems in practice is defining the correct correspondences between the same points or these coordinates in uh, two coordinate systems. So um, here you can see an example of uh, three points that are well distributed in the measurement surrounding uh, and uh, where you can see that we need to know at least seven coordinates uh, distributed over these points when we need to know the coordinates, uh, the same coordinates at the same time in the system B and system A. Um, so uh, insufficient distribution can happen if the points are clustered very close to each other like this, or uh, it can happen, for example, when they are distributed in a one straight line. And um, such measurement configuration introduces collinearity or non-independence of these observations, which leads to the ambiguous solution of the transformation parameters. Uh, let's get back to the problem of uh, correct point correspondences between coordinate systems. So by uh, correspondences, I mean that we need the knowledge that a certain point with the position defined in a local coordinate system uh, B is at the same time the same point with other set of the coordinates in the system A. And um, in practice, in practical applications, the registration is often resolved by introducing the artificial targets, as you can see on this slide, uh, in our surrounding. And such targets allows us at the same time measuring very precisely defined point in space, like the cross-section uh, of these uh, lines on this target. And uh, it allows us easy identification of such points, which leads to building the correspondences between coordinate systems easy. So it is easy to say that the target number one, like for example, this target, is, uh, is, has some coordinates in uh, point A. And when we are measuring our surrounding, it's easy to say we also measure this target number one again from the system B, and it has these coordinates, uh, these coordinates in this system. 
With the total station, we can directly aim at such targets, so we often use reflective prisms, like these ones, or black and white checkpoint targets uh, with well-defined and visible central point, as I previously showed. Uh, while in the case of terrestrial laser scanning, we have densely sampled measurements aiming in arbitrary directions, if you remember, and we need to estimate the coordinates of some uniquely defined point in space in post-processing. And therefore, we often also use black and white targets, and then we use the color information to help us identify the center, or we use uh, spherical targets, which allows us to estimate the sphere center using the best fit, uh, best fitting, uh, best sphere fitting algorithms. So to summarize, we have a problem of correspondences between points in different coordinate systems, and using artificial targets gives us the advantage that these points are well de well defined in space, and we can also easily uh, generate the correspondences between coordinate systems. Another possibility is to use the measured object themselves. For example, we can measure well-defined points or key points, such as, for example, building corners that are marked on this slide, where with the total station we would need to aim on at least three corners of the building, while with terrestrial laser scanner we would need to somehow reconstruct these corner, point, corner positions from the point cloud. In any case, uh, this solution has advantage that we do not need additional equipment for the registration process, but it has the disadvantage that the points are not well defined in space. So the estimates of the transformation parameters in the end between these two coordinate systems will be less accurate. Um, Another way to solve the registration problem using the measured object is to use many dense point-wise measurements over the whole object area, so generally just to use the whole point cloud. In this case, the registration is often solved by the ICP or iterative closest point uh, registration algorithm. And a uh, final uh, possibility to um, to, to, to solve the registration problem by using the measurement object is uh, to detect the geometrical features such as planes or planar patches or uh, edges, for example, uh, of the measured object. However, such solution requires a more complex set of equations than the equation that I previously showed you uh, for solving the registration problem. And uh, besides the good distribution of these geometrical features or elements, they also need uh, to vary in all three dimensions to uh, have a well-posed uh, um, system of equations and to allow us a good registration results. To summarize, we can either use at least three artificial targets or at least three points defined on the measured object to indirectly estimate the transformation parameters for example, in the adjustment process, as I previously mentioned. However, there is also a third possibility of estimating the transformation parameters, and that is directly observing the parameters uh, using the additional hardware or additional sensors. This solution is most often used to define only some of the parameters, or in other words, it is used to reduce the degrees of freedom. And this uh, reducing degrees of freedom is important as it helps us to increase the registration efficiency. For example, if there is less degrees of freedom, we maybe need only two targets in our field and not three. And it also uh, improves the accuracy of the registration results. And um, there is also a possibility of estimating all of the seven uh, parameters with additional hardware. However, this will not be discussed in this lecture. So, uh, how the degrees of freedom can be reduced? The nice property, for example, of the sensors that use uh, EDM technology for the distance measurement is that the scale of the coordinate system is indirectly defined or fixed uh, just by having at least one distance measurement. Uh, so the principle of electronic distance measurement, in short, is that the high accurate clock measures the time that the laser beam needs to travel from the sensor to the object and back, and by multiplying this time with the known constant of the speed of light, uh, we uh, derive the measured distance in meters. So 
um, because this distance is defined in meter, meters, the scale of the coordinate system is fixed. The important note is that the speed of light in atmosphere is not the same as in the vacuum, and uh, this changes with different atmospheric con conditions, such as, for example, with the temperature and pressure. Therefore, uh, these changes need to be known in order to set the, co the correct scale of the coordinate system. Um, another way to reduce the degrees of freedom is by using a leveling sensor or inclinometer. With such sensors, we can measure how the instrument and therefore the sensor-related coordinate system is oriented in space in comparison to the local gravity vector. Um, as the z-axis, in the most cases, is pointing upwards, the x and y axis are approximately horizontal in space. Uh, with the inclinometer, we can measure how much this plane spawning through x and y axis uh, is inclined in comparison to the local hor horizontal plane. So, uh, a simple example of uh, how some incl inclinometers work, like this one, is by using a pendulum. And um, except the pendulum, we also need to have some kind of the angular encoder, which tracks how much this pendulum moved from its original uh, zero position in order to be aligned with the direction of the gravity. If such measurements are realized in two orthogonal directions, they can be used to directly estimate the Euler rotation angles around the coordinate system axis x and y, like these two degrees of freedom. So most of the geodetic equipment, such as total stations and terrestrial laser scanners, have an inbuilt sensor called compensator, as you can see on this slide, uh, which estimates the inclination of our local sensor coordinate system in comparison to the horizontal plane, so in two orthogonal directions. And it can also directly apply uh, so it, it can also directly apply these estimates of the um, sensor inclination to correct our measurements so that horizontal angular, angular, uh, angular measurements would really be horizontal in space and vertical angular, angular measurements would really be vertical in space. Uh, so the most common principle how these compensator work is uh, to have a laser so source which shoots the laser beam uh, to the surface of a fluid, and if the instrument is perfectly aligned in space, horizontal in space, the laser beam falls exactly into the known position, let's say in the center of the CCD array, which measures the signal of the reflected laser beam. And then if the instrument is tilted in, in space, the reflection of the laser beam uh, from the fluid surface uh, falls somewhere else on the CCD array, and we can measure this offset in comparison to the perfect case of the perfect uh, horizontal case, and we can estimate the tilt angles in two directions. And, um, and uh, therefore, we can directly measure two rotational angles that we need for the sensor registration. The precondition for such sensors, these compensators, to work is that the instrument is already fairly horizontal in space, as these instruments are typically very sensitive and then therefore they have very short working range. To summarize, the scale factor is most often fixed uh, by using the electronic distance measurements and the rotation around y and x axis uh, can be fixed and defined by using leveling sensors or compensators. That means that in practical applications, we often need to solve the registration problem with only four degrees of freedom, as you can see on this equation uh, in the bottom. Uh, so we need typically to find only three translations and one rotation around the Z or standing axis. So as previously mentioned, when measuring the large objects, we typically need more than one instrument position and in order to have uh, all measurements in a single, single coordinate system, we need to find the transformation parameters 
between each of these systems, and we typically do this consecutively, so one after another. So we uh, transform uh, the measurements of the first coordinate system into the second one, then we uh, transform these two uh, observations together in the third one and so on until uh, all the measurements are in a single local coordinate system. Um, if there is a possibility to make the correspondences between the last and the first uh, position of our instrument, we generally tend to realize this because uh, then we have a loop closure uh, which can help us control our measurements and our estimates of the transformation parameters. When we have a loop closure, we can actually make the process of the registration within a single large adjustment, which increases the accuracy of the registration results. Mm, to summarize, to determine seven transformation or registration parameters, uh, we can use artificial points or targets um, or we can use the measured object, either by detecting key points, using the whole point cloud, or using the extracted geometrical features. Or we can use additional hardware. In most cases, we are actually using the combination, some combination of these. So very often we are using hardware plus um, measured object or hardware plus targets. And um, this discussion holds for all sensors with the measurements that lead to the 3D Cartesian coordinates of the points in space, such as total station, laser scanner, or, or 3D LiDAR. And the same set of equations can be used for the GNSS devices. However, as they measure uh, the coordinates which are directly defined in the global coordinate system, we'll talk more about them in the context of georeferencing. What I also wanted to mention here is that the registration of the local sensor coordinate system can become more complicated when the sensors do not have 3D observations, uh, which happens, for example, in the case of 2D laser scanners or 2D LiDAR systems and in the case of cameras. With 2D scanners, the observations are often represented in also with the 3D Cartesian coordinates. However, they are distributed just within one plane, so they are practically 2D. And this means that we cannot use targets, key points, or planes, as we could have done in previous examples. Then now we can only use uh, this pass point cloud, which is, um, which is um, distributed just over one vertical profile. Uh, or we can use uh, linear geometrical features that can be identified in this profile. In the case of the camera observations, the observations are uh, 2D coordinates in the image coordinate system, and in order to get the connection to the 3D space, we need to solve additional or another form of equations, which are called collinearity equations, and you will learn more about them from Professor Stachnes. What additionally holds for camera is that we always need to solve the problem of the scale factor as uh, we have no direct distance measurements, so no EDM measurements are involved. And finally, I also wanted to uh, shortly talk about what are the other reasons for the sensor registration except making a 3D model and, and, and joining all observations in a single coordinate system. And uh, one of the reasons, uh, for example, why to estimate the registration or transformation parameters between camera and a 3D laser scanner or a cameras and a 2D laser scanner is to be able to color the point cloud. Um, so once uh, when we know exact correspondences and exact transformation parameters between camera co uh, local sensor coordinate system and scanner local sensor coordinate system, we can, um, we can, for each point in a point cloud, uh, we can add or know the exact uh, color information from the image pixels. And uh, as the 2D camera observations uh, are involved, we need to solve, again, the collinearity equations. Uh, however, the main problem in this registration task between camera and 3D laser scanner is precisely detecting corresponding points. And solving this task is a part of the ongoing research efforts, and it is most commonly solved by detecting the corresponding points 
that are automatically detected in a point cloud and in the image using some of the advanced point cloud and image processing algorithms. And once we have the correct correspondences between point cloud and an image, the task of solving the transformation equations is quite trivial. So the things get even more complicated when registering coordinate systems of a cameras uh, to the coordinate system of a 2D uh, laser scanner. Again, the main problem are point correspondences, and again, the problem is a part of the ongoing research efforts. Uh, one of the existing ways to solve this problem is to use such chessboard patterns, as you can see on these images, and to detect corners of the check checkboard fields and define the plane using the camera observations. And at the same time, the, when the image is taken, we need to take uh, 2D uh, LiDAR measurements, which are uh, point-wise measurements falling in one line onto this plane. And this allows us building correspondences. If we repeat multiple measurements by varying a checkboard position and orientation in space, we can build correct correspondences between camera and a scanner observation by observing time at which measurements are done, and then we can solve the registration problem. This is just one of the common ways how this problem can be solved. And finally, uh, another reason for the registration is the formation monitoring or change detection. On the right-hand side of this slide, you can see the sketch of deformation monitoring task where we need to observe how one landmass uh, moved between two points in time. And in order to be able to track and describe the movement of this uh, land, landmass or landslide, we need to estimate the registration parameters. There are two possible solutions to this problem. And one is that if we have the point clouds of the landslide, like we have on this uh, example, uh, we in two time points, we can actually detect uh, key points and match them using, um, using some special algorithms to solve for the unknown registration parameters. And these registration parameters directly tell us how the landslide translated or rotate, rotated in space over time. The second way is to register each of these measurements into local coordinate system that we consider to be stable over time. For example, we can realize such a coordinate system uh, by setting these uh, pillars around the landslide. And then if uh, the measurements of both time points are transformed into this unique local stable coordinate system, it is easy to calculate the displacement vectors between the corresponding points in both uh, epochs, in both time points. And um, that was it considering the registration of the local sensor coordinate system systems. The part of the lecture, uh, the next part of the lecture will be dedicated for to georeferencing. So, as I already mentioned, there are different realizations of the global coordinate systems, and they are all somehow fixed to our planet. So, not to repeat myself, you will hear more about them in the next lecture. What is important for this lecture is that the georeferencing or moving from local to global coordinates again requires solving the same set of the same equations. Uh, only in this particular case of georeferencing, geo the scale parameter is never an issue. Uh, so in the end, we have six degrees of freedom, or we are looking for three translations and three rotations between local and global coordinate systems. Uh, so the main question for practice, again, is how to get these six parameters. And we have two main solutions for this problem. One is to again introduce the artificial points or targets uh, in our environment uh, whose global coordinates we already know or we can directly measure. And the second option is to use additional hardware whose measurements are directly made in the global coordinate system. Uh, how this would be uh, done in practice, for example, so to georeference the measurements that we did with the terrestrial laser scanner, for example, from this position A with the, the, within this local coordinate system, um, we would need to have targets which are mounted on special adapters that would allow that we can switch 
targets after they are measured with the laser scanner with the GNSS antenna. This way, we can determine the coordinates of the target center directly in a global coordinate system. Then, after we successfully build correspondences between global and local scanner coordinate system, uh, the target coordinates uh, can be used to uh, easily solve this 3D similarity transformation e equation with six degrees of freedom that we had previously. The second solution to this problem would be to directly measure the position and orientation of the laser scanner in the global coordinate system. An um, example how this task can be resolved for a 3D laser scanner is that we can use the GNSS antenna that is mounted directly above the origin of the local scanner coordinate system. And if we know this offset between the origin and in, an antenna, we can actually directly observe uh, the, the location of the TLS uh, local system origin in the global coordinate system or in a, glo yeah, in a global coordinate system. And um, additionally, um, we can uh, fix or define the rotations about uh, Y and X axis uh, by using the compensator measurements that we previously discussed. And we can also, for example, estimate uh, the rotation around the z-axis or our direction of viewing by using a compensator or a mag magnetometer. Or the another solution would be to have actually two antennas that are somewhere positioned on TLS, for example, on these sides, and estimate uh, the direction of the vector that uh, spawns through these two uh, GNSS antennas. And uh, this uh, solution is typically used both for static and kinematic georeferencing. So the static georeferencing refers to the static measurements when um, all measurements are, are made uh, from a single local coordinate system, which is static during the whole uh, cycle, one cycle of measurements. So this is the case for all previous examples that we had in our lecture. While the kinematic georeferencing refers to the kinematic measurements, or in other words, it refers to mobile mapping, when the local sensor system is constantly moving over time while measurements are being taken. So in the case of this static georeferencing, to summarize the work, workflow, we have a registration of all local coordinate systems into a single local coordinate system of choice. And then we have B, georeferencing of this single coordinate system into the global coordinate system. Um, in the case of mobile mapping with multi-sensor systems, the, the procedure is a bit different. So the mobile mapping platforms are multi-sensor systems, meaning they have a variety of sensors installed, such as GNSS receivers, LiDAR systems, cameras, but also navigation units with accelerometers and gyroscopes. You will learn a lot about these mobile mapping systems in the course Sensor and State Estimation and Advanced Techniques for Mobile Sensing and Robotics. Here, we'll just briefly mention uh, these uh, systems in the context of georeferencing. So in the mobile mapping system systems, we have a sensor, let's say a 2D laser scanner, with its own local coordinate system in which our measurements are being taken. The system is mounted on a platform that is constantly moving through the environment and at the same time while the measurements are being taken. And our job is to transform all of these measurements into the global coordinate system. This task requires finding a position and orientation of the scanner coordinate system for each single point in time, or sometimes for each single measurement. So we need to solve six degrees, for, six degrees of freedom for each measured point. Um, this is solved uh, in short that before the measurement took place, we previously registered the scanner coordinate system to the body of the mobile mapping platform. We estimated these uh, transformation parameters, which are constant and fixed over the whole measurement time. And this process is typically referred to calibration process, and you will learn more about it later. 
once this relation between these two coordinate systems is known, we can use the measurements of the additional hardware placed on the moving platform, for example, GNSS antennas to continuously track the position of the platform. And um, as the relations is previously known between the scanner and the body frame, we can directly estimate the position of the scanner coordinate system in space or in the global coordinate system. One way how these, uh, how for example rotations could be also estimated is to place actually three GNSS antennas uh, on our mobile mapping platform, and then we can um, we can estimate the vectors between these three GNSS antennas and um, use the orientation of these vectors to estimate the orientation of our platform. Uh, but you will again learn more about this later. What is important for now is that. When in motion, the problem of georeferencing becomes more complex and we need to resolve it practically for each measurement individually. And we have more, uh, more transformations than only one single uh, set of six degrees of freedom. The final result of successful applying of coordinates transformation is a 3D georeference point cloud, as you can see on this slide, for example, that we uh, acquired with our mobile mapping system here at IgG. Um, yeah, that's it. This is somehow how it looks like in the end. And um, finally, to re recapitulate this lecture, uh, transformations between sensor coordinate system is a frequent task in engineering geodesy. And it usually is solved by 3D similarity transformation with seven degrees of freedom, where we can distinguish between registration or transformation between local sensor coordinate systems and georeferencing or transformation into the global coordinate system. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention. And these are my main references where you can uh, find out a lot about um, on the topic of sensor-related coordinates transformations and about the typical tasks that need to be solved in the engineering geodesy.